So here with uh, Dieter, Dopefer, and Felix, Tuesday Night Machines, and Ben Divkid, for anyone that's new to uh, me and the channel. Um, we couldn't all be in the same space and not talk to each other. We exactly. always bump into each other at other trade shows, we don't really get time to sit and chat properly. An occasional message here and there. Um, and there's a few things we want to touch on. I'd, I'd like to start just briefly though with a little bit of your background. I'm sure you, we've spoke about this before in other areas, but just for the sake of people watching that may be new. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to start, Felix? Sure. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I'm Felix from the Tuesday Night Machines YouTube channel, and I do lots of modular stuff. I started uh, with modulus in 2012, I think, with the Duffer system, of course. And the thing is, like, I, I couldn't really get like one whole system um, at that time, so I thought, okay, what was, what might be good alternative modular? And I thought, hey, I learned to play the theremin, so I bought two theremin antennas yeah. and just you know an oscillator and yeah, and the VCA, and that was it. And then I practiced. Like on a in a Duffer case, just with two antennas, the theremin, until I could afford more modules and mm -hmm. uh, and go on with that. And that was kind of funny, really, looking back, because it was a little weird, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd just share a quick little story as well. Thinking of the first up for modules, uh, the Quad ADSR. As soon as I got into modules, I was like, can I have four of these? So I've still got that, it still gets used. <laughs> I think massively underrated the um, A189, the bit modifier. Yeah, mm. it, does, it does a ton of crazy stuff to CV. And I think people don't realise these things. Spring yeah. reverb is still in the case. I remember watching Rouse World of Sims. Right. And I just binge watched the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got my first modules. Yeah. Yeah. That's but the only content that was out there back then, right? It yeah. was Rouse World of, World of Sims yeah. with Duffer modules. Right. And it was great content. It still is great content. But I think yeah. he stopped, right? He didn't. He yeah, I don't think he's making. Yeah. But there's a lot. If people haven't seen Rouse World of Sims before, uh, there's a lot of videos yeah. to watch and a lot to learn from them. But just briefly, what led you up to ultimately starting the company and building well, modules? I can make a two minute tour or a yeah. 20 minute tour, <laughs> whatever you prefer. Yeah. Okay. I started uh, during my studies, I studied physics uh, in Munich and was playing in a band and uh, Sometimes the amplifier was damaged, or the rubber pedal, or, or the bus box. So I started uh, to try to repair the devices. And uh, very soon I uh, was attracted by effect units like phasers, flangers, mm -hmm. bus boxes, rah -rah, and so on. And that's all a, already a, a little bit into the direction of synthesizers because. Uh, it's also electronic sounding yeah. stuff. Uh, well, and uh, when I finished uh, my studies, uh, I had to decide uh, to go to the industry, mm -hmm. working as a physicist, or do my own thing. And I decided to, to, to do my own thing, and I remember that it was a problem with the family. <laughs> it was, it said, oh my gosh! Now he's ready with his study and drops away yeah. mm -hmm. but in the meantime they, was think, it? they, they think different <laughs> <laughs> was it modular sense from the start or did you no 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 uh, at this time there was uh, a synthesizer in Europe very popular called the formant it was a DIY mm -hmm. project right. published by an electronic magazine elector and every month uh, they published one module they started with the power supply one week, no, one month later, the keyboard interface, then I don't remember, VCO, VCF, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And it took much more than one year until uh, all <laughs> the modules were described. And uh, I built uh, a foreman, but very soon I uh, discovered that a few functions are missing for me. And so I, this one of my first designs, I added uh, a few foreman compatible modules like voltage control phaser and frequency divider and envelope follower, a, a couple of, of modules like that. And there's some of the early now discontinued rare dope for modules if you like. <laughs> you had a frequency shifter and a, a phase shifter and I guess components are not available for some of these things anymore. Uh, yeah, but the, for the frequency shifter we are working on a redesign because oh, a lot good. of customers are asking why do you no longer offer a frequency shifter, but uh, we are working uh, on a redesign with the parts which okay. are uh, well. Yeah, this was uh, the beginning. The next uh, important step for me was uh, 
I heard about Curtis Electro Music, CEM, which mm -hmm. uh, were used in virtually all polyphonic or even monophonic synthesizers at that time. And I had uh, the chance to meet Doug Curtis okay. and uh, to ask him if he would be interested if I uh, take over the European distribution for this for his circuits and uh, after a couple of uh, negotiations uh, he agreed and so uh, I became the European distributor for Curtis chips and then I started uh, one of my first synthesizers which were uh, sold to the public. Earlier I did uh, also some uh, some other stuff, but it's it was mainly just just for me. Mm -hmm. So the first product was based on Curtis Curtis chips. It was called the Voice Modular System. It was a uh, complete voice on one board and could be uh, expanded by the additional boards, expansion boards with LFOs and, and noise and, and, and so on. Was, so I think this was the first uh, product uh, where we or where I was uh, recognized by the, by the public. Well, and then uh, we designed mainly uh, MIDI keyboards mm -hmm. because the interest in, in analog synths yeah, it went really, really, really down. Really <laughs> because everybody wanted to have a DX7 and, and all this digital stuff. But I always had in mind uh, I want to build some someone uh, something modular mm -hmm. and uh, then early in the 90s I started with uh, the compact and MS404 mm -hmm. it right. was uh, the first uh, complete analog synth I designed and uh, it was it was selling very good at this time uh, the prices for second-hand units like TB303 or TRA were incredible high, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I said to you, oh yes, that yeah. is, is, it's, it's, it's not a problem to build uh, similar devices uh, with modern uh, technology. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. why we designed the MS404, and after the big success of the MS404, I just said, okay, now I want to have a modular, mm -hmm. because in the early days, I've seen um, MS like in Palmer with Life mm -hmm. on stage with something that looked like a telephone distribution yeah, device, yeah. And, but the sound was so great. And I said, I, I want to build something like that, my own. And so the first modules are nothing but the, the circuits of the MS404. Okay, right. So the VCO is nothing but the VCO yeah. for, for the, the a120 VCF is nothing but the VCF of the MS404. The ADSR 140 is nothing but the ADSR of the MS404, and so on. And uh, I remember when I said, "Okay, I want to go to Musikmesse Frankfurt with a small modular system." Everybody said, "Nobody's interested in that stuff." But okay, if you want. You can have a small place behind the keyboards in front a lot of, <laughs> okay. of the fat keyboards and I had my, my small uh, modular synth for demonstration. I think it was in 1994, 1995, something mm -hmm. like that. Well, what happened? Nobody, nobody was looking at the keyboard, <laughs> okay. but there was totally crowded around uh, just, one case. My, just my, my small <laughs> modular stuff. Well, well, the rest is history. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so from that point, mid '90s, all the interest in the modular. I mean, how big is the company now? Company now, what has it gone from just you to uh, how many people? Yeah, it's or? it's it's, um, it's very interesting. Uh, I started alone, mm -hmm. then my girlfriend Sibylla uh, okay. joined the company, and uh, it increased more and more. I think maybe seven, or eight years ago. I don't remember. We had uh, about 10 people, but then we decided uh, to outsource the production because at this time everything was uh, done in the company. Mm -hmm. The assembly of, of the PC boards, the soldering, the mechanical mounting, yeah. testing, packaging, everything was yeah. in the company. Um, one of our employees decided to go to Argentina 
another one uh, went away from the company and so I said, okay, should we uh, look for new employees or should we try uh, external production and uh, I decided to external Understand production. It. In the meantime, we are back to four, okay. Okay. but we do more than two or three times the sales of the time where we return. Yeah. So yeah. the outsourcing yeah. allowed you to grow yeah. better. Right. Right. So right. We, I, I can focus uh, on, on development and designing and uh, all these other works combined with a company with so many people because sometimes there are problems with between the employees mm -hmm. and so on. So sure. it, it takes too much time, so yeah. now I can focus uh, on what I really like to do. And at that time, did, is that when it moved to, uh, did you move mainly from through hole to surface mount technology at the same time? Partly, partly. Uh, to speak the truth, I still prefer the through hole. Okay. Uh, there are two reasons. We have a lot of customers who want to modify their models. Yes. So would it be possible to have the sensitivity of this input a little bit higher or smaller, mm -hmm. or I, I want to add this or that, I want to change the characteristics of a yeah. control and something like that. And so we say, okay, look at the board, to the sister R24, change from 100 kilo value, ohm to, or, yeah. to 47 mm -hmm. kilo ohm, then you will have uh, yeah. longer attack time, time yeah, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Looking for. But this would be uh, very difficult if you use SMT. SMT. Yeah. 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 And another reason is uh, the service. There is a problem uh, that uh, you can add a lot of documents. Uh, you have to pay attention to put the, the bus board in the, uh, mm -hmm. the connect bus connector in the right position. You have to pay attention that, uh, not to have electrostatic charge when you touch the modules. Mm -hmm. You have to pay attention to use the correct power supplies. We have a lot of customers who build their own power supplies, which may yeah. uh, generate the wrong voltage. So uh, there is some chance uh, that the parts are damaged. And replacing an, an SMD chip with many pins is, is the help. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem is, for example, if you have a board which is not working and you have 10 chips up on board, sometimes you don't work. know which one is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in through hole technology, you, you simply replace one after the other because yeah. there are sockets and it takes two minutes. Mm -hmm. But I think and this is really great, like especially that, um, and I think when you visit uh, the Dirtful website and do some research, you get this feeling that like you've got this really technical background and you're not also not afraid to put the information out there, like how you service stuff. Right, right. And I've linked so many people who were new to Modulus to the DIY page, the Dirtful yeah, DIY page, yeah, and I still yeah. visit it and have it bookmarked because yeah. you find good explanations, for example, what a resistor does, right. how a potentiometer right. works, yeah. and even how to yeah, modify the modules or create your own even. Right. Right. And I think this is really valuable um, because it makes um, the people realize that it's not some black box, right. um, but they can actually take part in the design right. themselves. Right. 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 Um, and just the fact if someone gets it and people get lots of modules, they sell them, lots of people turn over a high volume of equipment, and to have, say, an envelope and just to feel like to play to what you just said, that oh, I wish the attack time was just a touch longer. And mm -hmm. for you to be able to say, you see the top resistor R12, or that, swap it for this and that will do it. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. It allows you to do that, which, yeah. you, well, you couldn't really do in surface yeah. map. We, we <laughs> also have a, a page which has to be updated, okay, I know, where uh, there are the silk, silk screens of the, of the boards. Ah, okay. okay. And you see there's capacitor, I don't know, C4, and this is responsible for the Mm -hmm. ah, okay. For the time of, of the envelope, for example, if you double uh, the capacitor, you double the times, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, it's not complete for the new modules, they are still missing, but uh, the idea is uh, to give uh, all customers documents where they can see how to change parts to, to adjust uh, the functions. For, for the application. Mm. And while we're on topic on the new modules, I think because that is very interesting right now, you just released the Polyphonics yeah. line of modules, right? Yeah. Um, and I think this is a big step for Modulus, right? Because it was usually monophonic because it was such a right. hassle to tune several voices, yeah. then you have to convert MIDI into a polyphonic uh, yeah. CV. Um, and really looking forward to what we get out of this transition or out of this uh, new, um, new world now because. Yeah. Um, 
having that in one module is like super useful. Yeah, but for the uh, polyphonic modules, we had to use SMD technology. Oh, of course, because just, it, right, just a bit. Right. Yeah. So usually we have. Uh, the main board in front, which is still through hole, yeah. where you have access uh, to, to the main functions like uh, frequency range, intensity of the modulation, where you can, which can still be modified. Mm -hmm. But on the back of it, there are in SMD technology the, the filter boards, which there is no access to the to the parts. But the the main functions are still in in, in through hole, mm -hmm. so that you are able to adjust it. Uh, to your application. I think what's really interesting with the polyphonic modules is that they are presented how they would be on a polyphonic synth because you could build a quad polyphonic system if you just had four of everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't need four ADSR contracts, four attacks, four decays, four sustains because that isn't how a polyphonic synth works. Yeah. It's one set of controls. You raise the attack time, mm -hmm. every voice has a longer right. attack time. Right. Right. And it's presented in the same way which allows for all the articulation that you would expect yeah. without having to go in <sighs> I wish I had a bit more release and you'd have to find four of them. And, yeah. Yeah. and the same yeah. for the filter as well. It is, right. You get a polyphonic synth, it's, it's not four cutoff controls or rarely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that it's presented in such a way. We should say this was developed, uh, the, all the, the uh, smaller version of the oscillator and then the quad with uh, strong yeah. Yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the <laughs> idea of the polyphonic models is not mainly uh, to build a polyphonic synth in the usual way. Of course you can do it. You can uh, use a MIDI keyboard, use uh, the polyphonic interface, and build a standard polyphonic synth with VCO, VCF, VCO. What I always show uh, during uh, demonstrations is to use uh, the polyphonic modules for new functions, for polyphonic function, functions, but not like playing a polyphonic keyboard. For example, I show uh, you can use uh, a small keyboard, which addresses uh, the pitch of the four VCOs. But then I don't use uh, the gate outputs of the interface, but I take the gates from a trigger sequence, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. So you can uh, play chords, but they are triggered not by, by, by And that also the kind of quantizes the performance as yeah. well. So for people right. that aren't as comfortable, <laughs> right. Right. but they know the chord shapes that yeah. they want. Right. Or so another example, I use uh, Random voltages, quantized random voltages, uh, you know, generated by a, by a random source, which is followed by a quantizer, and from the quantizer it goes to four sample and holds. We have a module which has eight sample and holds. We I just mm -hmm. use four of them, and I uh, connect the outputs of the four sample and hold to the CV inputs of the VCO. And for example, I use uh, uh, the triggers from the trigger sequencer in this uh, patch you generate polyphonic random uh, structures. And musical because of the yeah. quantizer as the well. Quanti and, and you can adjust the quantizer that it generates only tones uh, from, from a major scale or, or major chord with the, the sixth or the seventh. And you can uh, play polyphonic sounds totally different than playing on a, on a keyboard. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the idea of the uh, polyphonic And models. they still have, the filter still has the individual CV input, so you could yeah. take four drum voices from somewhere and right. still CV right. each, in the, each right. envelope individually and the filter individually. Right. It seems that flex, very flexible. Yeah. But with the advantages we were talking with it being developed with Strom, that you said, well, just use four of our oscillators when they were getting into polyphonic modular, yeah. but they want the master control, yeah. which is yeah. the kind of right polyphonic keyboard aspect, you have right. a set of controls right. that influence right. the whole yeah. system. Yeah. For example, the, the, the filter modules are very complex um, because if you want to control the modulation amount, you need a VCA okay. on, the, on this filter board. If you want to control the, the audio level, you need a VCA. Mm -hmm. So the filter board are not just filters, there are also a lot of VCAs on it because uh, for each voltage controlled uh, amplitude you need a VCA. Mm -hmm. You need a VCA for the for the envelope amount, a VCA for the for the audio level, a VCA for the for the resonance. And is matching those VCAs still a hard thing to do or is that gotten easier? Uh, there are trimming uh, the, the VCAs are are very very good. Mm -hmm. So they are they don't need to be uh, adjusted but for example we discovered that it's essential 
uh, to adjust the Q, the, the, the resonance, mm -hmm. because if you increase uh, the resonance, the filters should start to self-oscillate nearly mm -hmm. at the same point. Right. So we, we really have to adjust for each of the filter boards that they uh, start self-resonating at the same position of the control. So yeah. it's it's a little bit of, of, of adjustment, but uh, it's necessary in, in, the, in the first prototypes, we didn't have it. And the first uh, filter started to self-oscillate at position seven, the next on mm -hmm. the 7.5. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, it might be interesting, but uh, it should be better that they uh, behave the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also the new, and it's hard to escape because you could see it from such a distance, the new LED modules as well, yeah. mm -hmm. which leads to, me and Felix were talking, does this lead to video synthesis in any way or, yeah. or more external control for lighting or? No, the, 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 the idea came from Strem, uh, yeah. which we uh, performing yesterday. Mario said, uh, I have always a problem on stage when it's dark. I can't see the position of the knobs and, and, and the patchings and so on. I need some kind of, of, of decent uh, illumination. And I said, okay, we, we can do this, but it's boring to have uh, a static uh, mm. illumination. If I uh, build a module where you can adjust the, the brightness, it would be also easy to use CV inputs and Let's use not a, a, a one color LED stripe, let's use a RGB, a three color stripe. Mm -hmm. And so you have, uh, after all, the model has six controls, three controls for the offset, for the basic brightness of each color, and uh, three, in, uh, three attenuators for the th uh, three CV inputs for each color. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you, you can use it static when mm -hmm. you are patching, for example. Or during the performance, you can use, for example, the envelope of the bass drum to control the, the, the red lights and mm -hmm. the noise for the blue yeah. ones. Yeah. So, so it's up to you. And will that be released for sale, or is that yeah, a it, special? No, it's already. Oh, uh, it's already uh, uh, last week, the first modules were sent to Alex Ford, our okay. dis distributor, All and right. they should be in the shops during the next weeks. Yeah, and uh, I have to uh, point out that. You get the module for the price and the LED stripe is free. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the problem is that uh, it's very easy to damage the LED stripes. We damaged during our tests a lot of them. Okay. If you bend them, they are broken. And a lot uh, of the consumer ones that you can yeah. buy just. Yeah, but they are cheap. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they are they, cheap. They, yeah. That's why we say uh, we, we just sell the module and the LED stripe is for free. And if you want a longer one or if, if the LED stripe is damaged, you have to buy a new one, but they are cheap and are, yeah. are available on, on eBay. And, and yeah, yeah, they're really easy to get hold of. And you can also, we, we uh, tried different LED stripes. Uh, the standard uh, stripe is one meter. Um, you can, without a problem, uh, connect the two meter stripes. We also tried a five meter stripe, but in this case, uh, you should at heat sinks to the power transistor. There are transistors mm -hmm. in there okay. which are used to control uh, the brightness of the of the colors, and uh, they become a little bit hot for five meters. Yeah. And you also need a sufficient power supply. Uh, if the internal power supply uh, should not be used, which I recommend, there is a connector at the front panel where you can connect an external low cost uh, okay. power, a wall wall power yeah. supply, because the LEDs do not require 12.00 volt mm, no, uh, high precision, which, which is very expensive. You can use a, a, a low-cost 12-volt supply for the LEDs. So what, what I wanted to ask you as well, and, and interested on where you maybe think this will go as well, Felix, that where do we see modular going? There's always been, all the classic modules are covered in the Dofa range. There's all like frequency shifters. You don't really see many frequency shifters. And as I mentioned, the bit modifier, just some crazy stuff to CV that I haven't seen anywhere else. We've seen modules get really small. They seem to get a little bit bigger for a while, generally, in your Orac and other companies. Um, you've brought in some smaller, more performance-orientated systems right. as well. Where, I mean, I know you've said before in interviews that you didn't think you'd be here when you started. I don't think anyone saw that module would be what it is mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Where, do you, where do you both feel like it's going, generally? Well, I think there's still like a lot of stuff to be discovered that is, not, that is like 
older knowledge, I think. Like we talked about like uh, Ken Stone or search systems, which uh, have modules which you don't really find in Eurorack form, um, mm. although they've been out there for a while and the circuits have been, have been openly available. Um, and I think, um, yeah, the frequency shifter, that's also a, a, a classic circuit, I would say, right? Um, so I think that um, we will see some more branching out. Like It's not just this format that offers this, but all other formats might offer that as well. Um, and, but I think we will also see more digital modules. I think there has been this shift where in a few years back people always wanted analog, yeah. I think. And nowadays it's, it's mixing, which is good because with digital you can do a lot or many other things than mm -hmm. analog, and you can just mix it how you like. Mm. Yeah, well, um, I have been asked this question about the future yeah, of many, many times. Several, times, many times, times. <laughs> you could even say, say the angle of... I, I was always <laughs> wrong. <laughs> so, uh, you could take the angle of where would you like to go, or where do you see the wider yeah. Yororak scene going? Just, I think there's yeah. one trend, which, which you already mentioned, that more and more uh, musicians um, use the module live on stage and they ask for more functions behind smaller front panels. Uh, that's why we also offer uh, in the near future uh, some of our standard modules in, in a slim version. Um, for me in person, the distances between the knobs would be too small, but uh, if the customers want to have it, and I understand, and I know like Ströme, they want to have small equipment, it, it's understandable. So I think that's definitely a trend uh, since a few months or even years, and I think this this will continue uh, at the moment. And I also agree that digital modules will will, will become more and more. Are there ideas that you'd like to implement personally in digital, either yourself or working with someone else, or? And will we see a line of more, more DSP focused stuff at any point? Or? No, we, we do not have the, the manpower and do not have the know-how for DSP. And so we say, okay, we know a lot of analog mm -hmm. designs and we will continue analog designs. We will, for example, also uh, offer during hopefully this year another fully analog frequency shifter. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll do the redesign. But we will not to go into the digital domain, DSP domain. Of course, we also have digital modules like uh, MIDI to CV interfaces or, or the, the bit cruncher, which you mentioned. These are also digital models, but they are not audio DSP models. No. They are control digit control digital models. And as both of you perform, um, I, I unfortunately wasn't there, but I've heard amazing things about a set you did recently. Mm -hmm. I think you said in Frankfurt it was, and then Felix, you performed as well. Where do you see interfaces going with modular? Or what do you personally maybe look like with modular? There's I mean, pheromines, ribbon, keyboards, the way that like the new trigger sequencer is very button heavy, mm. it's not menu driven at all, which is great. It becomes a performance feature, I feel. Mm. Where do you think that maybe control is going. So as things get smaller, I understand that four small VCOs is great because once they're in tune, they're controlled externally. So they can sit in the corner of the case out of the way. You're not maybe going to sweep the pitch like you would a filter cut off or something. Mm -hmm. So that I think that's great and it's great that's getting smaller. But the whole system can't be smaller. <laughs> Where do we maybe see interface and control going in the future? Yeah, I mean I've been playing with the instrument, the expressive polyphonic um, device uh, in the past uh, year. And um, I asked you about MPE capability maybe yeah. in a URAC right. module, but also I think in the URAC we also already have lots of different yeah. ways to control it. Yes, expressive so we have yeah, like exactly. distance sensors, right. touch, yeah. um, all Track that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the fact that a ribbon doesn't have to be pitched, the ribbon can change envelope time right. or depth, exactly. so we can already get there yeah. with some patching, I feel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess one could maybe foresee some kind of app integration like that you because people love to use their iPads and smartphones mm -hmm. nowadays for everything. So one could see some kind of receiver module that's connected via Bluetooth and on the iPad you can just arrange the knobs you like as a performance pad really that is de and, uh, decoupled from the modular even like 
were sending stuff through the air and not uh, connected with a cable. Mm. I think that would be maybe interesting to see. Yeah. But touch screens are not great for everything, obviously. Yeah. I think a nice way to frame the question to yourself, Dieter, is how how did you put that system together for the performance you did? How did you want them to interact and perform? Yeah. Um, uh, to speak the truth, it depends. <laughs> On the moon, upon, upon the day, the day on yeah. the, I, I don't yeah. know. So it's always the same. I say, okay, we go to Thoman, to the Synthet Actor, um, I collect the system, it will be the perfect system for this event. And I put it together, and they come here, and put it, and I say, oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's really, I don't know uh, how to say, uh, that's not the perfect combination no. for me. No, it, it changes uh, in minutes <laughs> because I have an idea. I want to do that, and now I realize, oh, this model is missing. Mm. But in this at this moment, uh, I realize it. Yeah. yeah. So I always have in the meantime standards like I have my trigger sequencer. I have a uh, small keyboard for the, for the polyphonic stuff where I can generate ports. I have my analog sequencer, I have uh, my small, we have a small keyboard module which I use for transposing and for general start, stop, continue, reset and so on. So these are the basics which are in each system. But which kind of uh, noises or monophonic voices, which kind of filters, it, mm. it differs from day to day, from hour to hour, from minute to yeah. so. So, people say, ah, oh, you are so lucky, you have access to all the models. <laughs> right. It doesn't help. <laughs> you it still can't make the perfect system. If you have yeah. access to all, several thousand models which are available on the market, you will still have the same problem. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's been like a tip for newcomers as well, right? Don't you don't need a wall of modules to make pleasing music or be satisfied with the system, right? Um, oftentimes the limitations also create creativity and then it, yeah. uh, it can work as well, right? Yeah. yeah. I think the, the next time we all see each other will probably be super booth. Yeah. In May. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, will you have the frequency shifter at no. that point? No. Okay, so yeah, bit definitely later. not. Okay. We will have uh, the slim modules. Okay. We will have the frequency shifter will not be finished. A friend has the original frequency shift and I yeah. love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite thing for percussion. Yeah, it's, that's really yeah it's, 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 a, it's a great thing. I do not expect um, high sales. I do it for myself because I also like, I, I totally like frequency shift. We will add some improvements like, um, how do I say, there will be a VCA, which closes when the input signal goes down. Okay. So uh, for each, frequency shifter or even ring modulator, you always have a little bit of feed through. It's impossible yeah. to obtain a ring modulator it without any feed through. Yeah. You have always a small bleed of, I don't know, minus 60 dB or, or whatever. And we will add an analog generator with a VCA. So if the input signal is zero, the VCA closes, but it can be adjusted. You can also mm -hmm. leave it open. That's uh, one small feature we will add compared to the old one. Great. Well, amazing. I'm really glad that at the Tom and Symphony Actor event, we got a chance to actually sit and talk to each other. We yeah. don't, this, it doesn't happen, as we said. I did to have Felix, and that, that, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> or, or we'll, you know, five minutes on camera and we don't get to speak to each other. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank see you, you at Superbooth. Yeah. All right, cool. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.